a great passage on faith. Something that God expects of all of us as his children is to believe him. And surprisingly, in the ministry of Jesus Christ, he only marveled at someone's faith one time. Isn't that something? I should say at their great faith. He did marvel later on in the chapter at the disciples' lack of faith, which is different. But this is the only time in the New Testament where Jesus actually marveled at someone's great faith. And so we need to take note as to why. Why did Jesus marvel at the faith of this, uh, this soldier? So notice here in Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 5 of Matthew 8, the Bible says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not. Great faith. Let's pray. Here I pray you use your word now in our hearts. Lord, the Holy Spirit would apply it to each of our lives, Lord, and we would look into each of our own hearts and be honest about where we are in this matter of faith. Do we truly believe you can do anything and trust you to do so? And Lord, I pray that needs would be met. Lord, whatever the need might be, conviction, comfort. I pray the Holy Spirit would use the word to accomplish that in each heart. And then we'd be opening our hearts to listen and to hear from you today. We want you to be glorified and to guide us in your truth. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So this man, he was a centurion. That meant that he had a hundred soldiers under him. So he was in a position of authority, as we see. And he came and he beseeched Jesus Christ. Not for himself, but for his servant, as we see in the passage. That word beseech is the same as the word ask. And doesn't Jesus tell us in Matthew chapter 7, ask? <coughs> ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. We're commanded to pray. We're, we're commanded to ask. And we should spend every morning beseeching God for many things, of course. The lost and our families and and our own spiritual walk, and, and we could go on all the rest of the day with the things we should be beseeching God for. But the centurion specifically came to beseech Jesus Christ on behalf of his sick servant. And we see in verse 6, he used the word Lord. Now this is important. He was acknowledging Jesus as Lord. Acknowledging Jesus as the one that had the power, that had the authority. This is important. You know, if you're not born again, prayer really is not effective, according to Scripture. We're, we're told as Christians to come boldly to the throne of grace, but that's because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's because he's our high priest, and we have, now have access to the throne. So, number one, you have to be saved. But you also have to be willing to acknowledge that Jesus Christ has the power to answer prayer, which he does. He is God. And that's what this centurion was doing. He said, Lord, in other words, you are God. You are the all-powerful one. You are the Lord. And Jesus even told us in John chapter 8, he says, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. If you're not willing to, to admit the person of Jesus Christ as the great I am of Scripture, you, you can't be saved. And obviously your prayers are not going to be effective even as a Christian if you're not willing to acknowledge that Jesus has the power to do anything. He told us, ask. He told us to ask, amen? And that's exactly what he did. He said, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick and of the palsy, grievously tormented, and Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. I love this. 
Jesus didn't hesitate. He said, I will come and heal your servant. You've come on his behalf. I have the power to heal. I will come and heal your servant. And really, we as God's children need to ask the question, does God want us to pray? And does God want to answer our prayers? Those are not rhetorical questions. The answer is yes. He does. So let's pray. Let's pray daily. Let's get, get alone with God every day. Let's pray all day long without ceasing. Jesus told many parables to encourage us to pray and to not faint and to not quit praying and to not, and to not quit asking, but just to keep praying. And God wants to hear our prayers. Go to Psalm 65, verse 2. We'll see this. And we could spend the rest of the morning talking about these great prayer promises of Scripture. There are so many of them. But this one in particular, Psalm 65, verse 2, look what it says. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. God is a prayer-hearing God. We've talked about in Sunday school his sovereignty. God is not a passive God. God is an active God. Amen? God cares about every aspect of our lives. He's watching over us, and he's in control of every aspect of our lives, i.e. his sovereignty. But he wants us to pray. When we pray and God answers, who gets the glory? God. And it's, that's why we're here, to all of the glory of God. And when we pray, what do we say? Lord, you have the power to answer. You have the power to provide what I'm praying for. So, again, it brings him glory when we pray. And the Bible says all things, Matthew 18, 20, what's 22, all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. And all through the scriptures were encouraged to pray. Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. That wasn't why Christ marveled. Let's find out why. Verse 8. It says, And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Jesus does not answer our prayers because we're worthy for them to be answered. Let's remember that. If, if our answers to prayers were based on our worthiness, then there would be none. If it wasn't for Jesus Christ, we'd be on our way to hell, and there's nothing we could do to change that. Praise God, he loved us enough to die in our place on Calvary and rise again from the dead. So we don't need to come to God with this attitude, Lord, I deserve for you to answer this prayer. That's not, that's not the right attitude to have. And he said, Lord, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy for you even to step foot into my house. And that always needs to be our attitude, is, Lord, I'm not asking you for this because I deserve it. I'm asking it because I'm your child and you're a loving, caring, merciful God. And you told me to ask. But if we start feeling like that we're worthy or that we deserve the answers to prayers, then we're, then we're in the wrong place. And, and I just appreciate his attitude. I'm not worthy, Lord. Even though uh, he was a centurion, had a lot of authority, he recognized that he also was a sinner. And of course, if you're not willing to recognize your sin, you can't even be saved. But it starts there. You don't need a Savior if you're not. So, why did he marvel? Verse 8, speak the word only. Now we're getting somewhere. Jesus said, I'll come to your house. He said, Lord, I'm really not worthy for you to come under my roof because, you know, I'm a, I'm a Roman centurion and I'm really not a very good guy, but if you'll just speak the word. By saying those words, do you realize Jesus... What, what the centurion was saying about Jesus, first of all, he was saying, Jesus, I acknowledge that you already know where I live. I haven't told you where I live. But I know that because you're God, you already know where my house is. You already know about my sick servant because you're God. And you definitely do not have to step foot into my house to heal him. The power of your spoken word is enough. 
And we read in Revelation 19, when Jesus returns to the earth, the Bible says, Out of his mouth proceeded the two-edged sword, and with it he should judge the nations. That is not talking about the literal sword. It's talking about the power of the spoken word of Jesus Christ, the same power that created the universe. And it's amazing that the Jews weren't willing to acknowledge it, but this centurion was, Lord, just speak the word. Just speak the word, and my servant in some other faraway town will be healed. Just speak it. And we need to be careful that we don't try to define how God should answer our prayers. Amen? And this is important. Let's go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. A lot of times we come to God with a prayer, which is asking, it's a request, and God wants us to do it. But we also come to God with instructions on how to answer it. And we're never told to do that. We're never told to say, Lord, I need you to answer this prayer in this way. Because he's God, and we aren't. Amen? So 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Now, Jesus has already acknowledged that it's his will. He is willing to come to this man's house. He's willing to heal the servant. So he's saying that... It's my will. I'm going to heal your servant. But a lot of the things we ask for may not be in accordance with God's will. When Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he pray? If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Lord, if it's, po if it's possible for man to be forgiven of his sin, for man to be redeemed without me having to be beaten and stabbed and have a crown of thorns put on my head and nailed to a cross and be forsaken, if it's possible, nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. That should be our attitude when we pray. Lord, this is, this is what I believe I need. And I'm asking for it, but I want your will. And this, this is big. This centurion, he's saying, Lord, I'm not going to tell you how to do your job as God, as the great healer. You say you're willing to come to my house, and I appreciate that, but really I'm not worthy. But I know that you have the power to just speak the word and he'll be healed. And I appreciate that he had this right attitude that it's up to God. And we need to have the same attitude. It's up to God. He wants us to pray. He wants us to ask. In Luke 18, 1, that men are always to pray and not to faint. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. We could go on and on. Keep praying. Keep asking. Never are we told to quit or give up. But it's not our faith that moves mountains, is it? It's God that moves the mountains. We place our faith in the God that has the power to move the mountains. We don't have the power to move the mountains. And it, it, often we, we get that confused. Speak the word only. I'm not going to tell you how to do things. And, and I appreciate you think about, it made me think about Naaman in the Old Testament. If you don't know the story of Naaman, Naaman was a man that had leprosy. He was a man that was in authority, but because he was a leper, things were kind of limited for him. Because when you were a leper, you, you, know, you had to be isolated. And he heard about this, this prophet that was able to heal. And so he sent for him and said, I... Can you please heal me of my leprosy? Actually, he sent to the king first, and the king told the prophet anyway. Uh, the prophet, Elijah, he said, go wash in the Jordan River, and you'll be clean of your leprosy. He got angry. He said, how dare him tell me to go wash in that stinky river? Why didn't he come to my house and make some big theater about it? Think about that, that attitude. He had a little, Naaman had a little servant girl who said, 
If he would have told you to do something really big or really difficult, you would have done it. But because he told you to do something very simple, you're throwing a fit. And he's like, yeah, that's true. So he went and washed in the river, and his leprosy was healed. We gotta be careful that we don't have this attitude that, God, I need you to answer this prayer in this way. He's God, we aren't. He knows what's good for us, and we don't. And so verse 9, I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. If you go to Luke chapter 7, verse 8, which is the parallel passage to this passage, he uses the word also. And I appreciate what he's saying here, Luke chapter 7, look at verse 8. He says, for I also am a man set under authority. What is he saying? Jesus, I acknowledge that you have authority. That you are the Lord. And as the Lord, he has all authority. Amen? Never forget that. He wants us to pray. He wants us to ask. We're told over and over again to commit all things unto him in prayer. But he never tells us to tell him how to answer our prayers. This centurion said, Lord, I recognize you're the Lord. I recognize you have authority, all authority. And I also recognize that you have the power to do anything just through your spoken word. Verse 10, when Jesus heard it, he marveled. Why did he marvel? He marveled because it said, speak the word only. You don't have to come to my house. He marveled because it said, I'm, I'm also under authority like you. I recognize that you're the man of authority. But this is the only time he marveled at someone's great faith. Now he did marvel later on in this chapter. Let's see if we can find it down later on. Where the disciples had a lack of faith. Look down at verse 23 of Mark chapter 8. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 8. It says, and when they had entered into a ship, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, and so much that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, why are ye fearful, O ye of Little faith. Wouldn't you rather be in the first category? The great faith? Instead of the little faith? This is a, an example from who, who else but these men that have been traveling with Jesus Christ now for a couple of years, the disciples. They're the ones getting rebuked for having little faith. And it's the centurion who Jesus marvels at his great faith. Because he believed Jesus could do it with just the spoken word. And he wasn't going to tell Jesus how to do things. The only other time that Jesus mentioned great faith, of course, was the Gentile woman. Who came to Christ and asked uh, for healing for a family member. And Jesus... Because she was a Gentile, he said, I'm not going to take God's food and cast it to the dogs, which is what Jews used to call Gentiles. And, G and she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. She could have just gotten angry and said, well, peace must be that way. I'm just going to leave. But she said, no. Jesus has the power to heal. And I'm just going to keep asking. Keep and then Jesus said that she had great faith and healed her daughter. So the greatness of his faith was knowing the unlimited power of Jesus Christ. Think about that. We come to Christ for salvation and we believe that he has the power to save us from hell. Think about that. Heal all of our sins. Take us to heaven when we die. Prepare us a mansion in heaven. And then we've been saved a while and a, a big trial comes into our lives or a big problem and we come to God and we start praying but back in the back of our minds we're thinking God's not going to answer this prayer. 
Either the devil has us tricked into thinking it's too big for God, which that doesn't exist, or he's not interested, which also isn't true. So go to Matthew 21 and 22, and I just want to show you a couple of verses that remind us this morning that the greatness of this man's faith was that he believed Jesus could do it with the spoken word, and he wasn't going to define that he had to come to his house and walk in and lay hands on him or whatever. He wasn't going to tell Jesus how to answer, but he believed Jesus had the power to answer how he pleased, that he was in control. Matthew 21, 22, all things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, comma, believing, comma, you shall receive. The key word in that verse is the word believing. Again, we believe Christ to save us from hell, but often we doubt, unlike the centurion, we doubt whether or not he can answer. It's the believing. Now go to Mark 11, 24. I just want to show you a couple of examples. This centurion didn't wonder if Jesus could heal his servant, did he? He knew he could heal his servant. And isn't that what faith is? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11, 1. Well, what does Hebrews 11, 6 say? Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Now look at Mark 11, 24. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire, when ye pray, what? Believe that ye shall receive them, and ye shall have them. There's that pesky word, believe. God wants us to believe. You say, well, of course I believe. I want to be a Christian, but I didn't believe. Yes, but do we really believe or do we doubt? Whether or not God can answer this prayer. Go to James chapter 1. We'll look at one more. James chapter 1, verse 5. This is one of the keys to answered prayer. Think about the, the four friends who brought their, their friend to Jesus and there wasn't room. And so what did they do? They climbed up on the roof, tore some tiles off, and lowered him down the four ropes on the four corners of his bed. Did they believe Jesus could heal this man? Well, they wouldn't go on all that trouble if they didn't. Think about the woman who she just needed to touch the hem of his garment. She didn't need anything else. If she could just work her way through the crowd and just touch his robe. And when she did, she was immediately healed. And Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? And the disciples said, what are you talking about? Well, there's a crowd of people. Everybody's touching you. He said, no, I felt virtue come out of me. Somebody just got healed. Now, he knew what he was asking for the disciples' sake. He, she said, I, I know. I know he has the power. I know if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And she touched the hem of his garment. He, she was healed. They believed. That's the key. Now James 1 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask him. Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberty and brave thought, and it shall be given him. Look at the next verse. But let him ask what? In faith. In faith. Nothing wavering. There was no wavering with the centurion, was there? He said, this is the Lord. This is the man of authority. He has so much power, he can just speak the word. And my servant will be healed. And wherever I live. And he knows where I live because he knows everything. And he knows who my servant is. And he knows my servant is sick. He can just speak the word. And he, he knows. And he will heal my servant. That's faith. And that's why Christ marveled. And we, we find that if you look down in Matthew 8, verse 13, where Jesus completed the story. Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. You see that phrase? As thou hast believed. See, it's not contingent upon Jesus' power, because there is no limits there. 
But as thou hast believed, so be it done. And the servant was healed in the self-same hour. Remember, one time in the entire New Testament, Jesus marveled at someone's great faith. This is that time. What made the difference? Faith. Knowing that Jesus Christ had infinite power, and once he knew that Jesus was willing to heal his servant, just speak the word, Lord. You don't need to take time out of your busy ministry of healing and preaching to come all the way to my house to heal my servant. Just speak the word, and it will be done. Because you're God, and you can do anything. That needs to be our attitude. When we pray, when we ask, and how many times we told the New Testament to ask and ask and pray and pray and pray. But we need to pray believing. Believing. If we doubt that God will answer, He won't answer. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Hebrews 11 6. Now I'll finish with one more thing, and that's 1 John 3.22. All of this hinges on where we are as well. Too many Christians today have this attitude that God is like a vending machine. And we just tell God to do something and he'll do it. It doesn't work that way. Look what he says, 1 John 3, 22. Whatsoever we ask, well, we, we love that phrase, don't we? Whatsoever. There's no limits. He told the disciples, pray to move mountains. There's no limits to God's power. We receive of him, but then God goes and puts a because on it. Because we keep his commandments. Uh-oh. You're saying that if we're living in sin, yeah, that's, that's what it says. If we're living in sin, God's not going to answer. That's what he said. Because we keep his commandments. Do you know what his commandments are? Do you know 150 of them? We did the study. We wrote it all down. It's there. But do you know what they are? Do you, do you regularly look at them and say, Lord, am I obeying all your commandments? I pray the Holy Spirit will show me the ones I'm not obeying because I want to walk in obedient Christian life. Because we keep his commandments. Then he goes on to say, and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. In other words, we're also serving him. So, God isn't a vending machine. God's gone. So it doesn't work that well. God, I'm your child, and I realize that I'm disobeying most of your commandments, but I'm still your child, so I need this. Thank you, Chang, I'll pull that out of the machine. It doesn't work. So we must have faith. And I know we've all heard this before, but it never hurts to be reminded. Believe. Believe and obey. And God will answer. If we don't believe that, then he won't answer. That's the thing. Nothing limits God like we saw there in James. Nothing wavering. It says, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind to toss. And the next verse, James 1, 8 says, Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Who? Those who waver in their faith. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. He's talking to saved people. This centurion had no doubt that Jesus had the power to answer his prayer. He knew Jesus was Lord. He knew Jesus had all power. And he knew Jesus even had the, the ability to, to speak the word. Lord, you don't need to come to my house. I'm really not worthy for you to bother. I'm a centurion. I have all these soldiers working for me. I'm part of the Roman mess. You just speak the word. Jesus stopped and took the time turn to his disciples and say, I've not seen greater faith in my entire ministry. Can you imagine that? I look forward to meeting that centurion someday.
saying thank you for teaching us this lesson. Amen. Think about that. Praise God. Great faith. That's what God wants us to have. Great faith. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you so much. We thank you.